Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of John Meehan? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, including the timeline of the crimes, then offer my analysis. John Meehan was born on February 3, 1959, and raised in California. He became a con artist at a young age. Allegedly, his father had taught him how to do it. John engaged in various types of fraud. For example, he jumped in front of a Corvette to scam the owner's automobile insurance company and put broken glass on a Taco Bell order, which one could argue only makes that food slightly more hazardous. John was also convicted of selling cocaine and eventually had to leave California as part of a plea deal. In 1988, John earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Arizona. He attended law school in Ohio, but his grades were very poor. He dropped out during his second year. In November 1990, 31-year-old John married a 25-year-old nurse named Tanya Sells. He lied about his age and said he was 26, he also used the name Jonathan instead of John. The couple lived in Ohio and had two daughters. Tanya supported John as he went through nursing school. In the year 2000, John asked Tanya for a divorce. She investigated his past and realized he lied about his age and that he had been charged with a crime related to drugs in California. She notified the police after finding drugs in the hospital where John worked in the home they shared. John was investigated at this time and again in January 2002, after his hospital co-workers saw him steal Demerol, and they noticed that he was in the possession of a firearm. John lost his nursing license in April of that year. In June, he pleaded guilty to felony drug theft, but then fled to Michigan after stealing an anesthesia kit. The police found him unconscious in a hotel with drugs all around him. As he was being transported to the hospital, he unbuckled the restraints, grabbed the kit, and jumped out of the ambulance. He ran to a nearby J.C. Penney and climbed on top of a cargo elevator. John was convicted of resisting arrest and drug possession. He was sentenced to six years in prison, but only served 17 months. He moved in with his sister in Hamilton, Ohio, then followed her to Newport Beach, California. In 2007, he once again followed his sister, this time to the Palm Springs area. John didn't work too much in California and had a drug problem. He went on a crime spree of stealing from women who he met on dating sites. He accumulated several restraining orders and racked up a number of criminal charges. By 2013, John lived in Laguna Beach, California. He was arrested for stalking. He pleaded guilty in February of 2014 to that charge and to being a felon in possession of a firearm. He was released in the summer of 2014, but violated a restraining order against another woman he had threatened. John was released on October 8. On October 10, 55-year-old John met a 59-year-old interior designer named Deborah Newell. Deborah had been married and divorced four times and had four adult children. They found each other on a dating website designed for people who are over 50. During their first date, which was at a restaurant in Irvine, California, John lied to Deborah and said he was a physician. Deborah found John to be physically attractive, but they argued later that night back at her residence when John initially refused to leave. The next day, he called and apologized. The couple went out on more dates. Some of John's behavior was suspicious to Deborah, but she really liked him. Deborah's older daughter, Jacqueline, felt differently. She did not trust John. Deborah's younger daughter, Tara, didn't trust him either, although she didn't say as much about it. In November, John and Deborah moved into a house together in Newport Beach. The rent was $6,500 a month. John told Deborah that he didn't want his name on the lease due to tax problems. Therefore, she put the residence in her name only. On the day before Thanksgiving, the couple had an argument with Deborah's two daughters. Tara felt as though her mother was choosing John over her. John and Deborah married in Las Vegas in December of 2014. 
The ceremony was in a courthouse, and no one was invited. In March of 2015, Deborah's nephew called her and shared some information which he had discovered about John. John was not a physician, and he had served time in prison. Deborah did not have a strong reaction to this revelation, but secretly started searching for evidence about John's past. She discovered that her nephew was telling the truth. John was a career criminal with a history of victimizing women. After reading various websites where women had posted warnings about how terrible John was, Deborah learned that he had been given the nicknames Dirty John and Filthy John. Deborah moved out of the house in Newport Beach when John was in the hospital getting back surgery. John was desperate to get Deborah back. He told her that he could explain everything. He only lied to her because he thought he would lose her if she knew the truth. John told her that she was the love of his life and he needed her. The couple reconciled and moved into an apartment in Irvine, California. Not surprisingly, the couple struggled in the relationship. John was not getting along too well with Deborah's daughter, Jacqueline, and did not want Deborah to see her anymore. After discovering that Deborah saw Jacqueline anyway, John threatened to throw Jacqueline in the ocean if it happened again. In April of 2016, Deborah filed to annul the marriage. At this point, John was living in Nevada. John sent her messages demanding money. Deborah filed for a restraining order, but it was denied because John had never physically attacked Deborah and was not threatening to do so. Deborah stopped communicating with John altogether. On June 11, 2016, John attempted to destroy Deborah's Jaguar XF by stealing it, pouring gasoline inside of it, and setting it on fire. He only managed to do a little bit of damage to the car. These days, Jaguar vehicles catch fire spontaneously, but back then it took a little bit of effort to get them to burn. Two months after this incident, on August 19, Jacqueline saw John stalking her in a white Toyota Camry. He drove away when she spotted him. Jacqueline was concerned that Tara might be John's next target. On August 20, 2016, John made his way to Tara's apartment building in Irvine in a rented 2016 Dodge Dart. In the vehicle, he had duct tape, cable ties, and kitchen knives. Tara left work at 5 p.m. and drove three miles to her residence. When she pulled into her parking space, she noticed a man standing behind a Dodge Dart. She didn't recognize the man as John and didn't think anything of it. Tara exited her vehicle carrying her miniature Australian Shepherd. John approached her carrying a Del Taco fast food restaurant bag with a knife in it. I imagine this wasn't the first time that bag carried something dangerous. He then attacked her with his taco bag concealed knife. John and Tara wrestled and fell to the pavement. As John was trying to stab her, Tara was on her back, kicking toward him, and managed to knock the knife out of his hand. The knife landed on the pavement just inches from her right hand. She grabbed the knife and started stabbing John in various places, like his shoulder, upper back, and arms. Eventually, she put the knife through his left eye and into his brain. She stabbed him 13 times altogether. John Meehan died in the hospital four days later, at the age of 57. The police determined that John's death was a clear-cut case of self-defense. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts in a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. John had several narcissistic characteristics, including arrogance, grandiosity, a sense of entitlement, superficial charm, and a lack of empathy. He also had many traits of psychopathy, including being impulsive, irresponsible, committing crimes, and having no remorse. John Meehan was a career criminal who, for the most part, was involved in stealing, fraud, and substance use. One of his major strategies was finding romantic interests who would fund his lifestyle and who he could steal from. He relied on his superficial charm to disguise his remaining negative characteristics. Item number two, John made an effort to be desirable to Deborah. For example, he pretended to be a physician and claimed he had served in the military. John was highly attentive when Deborah spoke to him, like he was a good listener. John ran errands for Deborah, functioned like an assistant, and was excited to go to her church. He worked diligently to convince her 
that he had deep feelings for her. They were destined to be together. John may have been charismatic and charming, but there were many warning signs that he was not an ideal romantic partner. Which brings me to item number three. Here are a few examples of warning signs with John's behavior. John never seemed to have any money. He claimed he had tax problems and his money was going to his children. He said that he was a freelance anesthesiologist and he was paid in cash by people without insurance. Yet he never had the cash. John did not appear to actually have a job. He would leave in the morning wearing scrubs, but then return quickly and go to bed. John spent a lot of his time playing video games like Call of Duty. John was always asking about Deborah's possessions, like what was in her safe at her home. He was fascinated with items of value that she possessed. John wore his medical scrubs everywhere he went. It was like the only outfit he had. The bottoms of his pants were frayed. Deborah once invited him to a formal dress cancer benefit. He wore his scrubs to that as well. John claimed to be a physician, but his fingernails were always dirty. This is quite unusual for physicians, even those who are not surgeons. John had a poor relationship with Deborah's daughters, even before he tried to murder one of them. He tried to convince Deborah that her children were jealous of her. They wanted Deborah to reject him because they did not want her to be happy. John was rude to Deborah's daughters, interrupted them when they were talking, and had poor eye contact. John tried to appear overly masculine, like carrying a heavy mattress by himself, and bragging about how he believed he was connected to the mafia in some way. And John would stop when passing by a mirror and comment on how good looking he was. Item number four. A mental health clinician told Deborah that John was only a danger to her, not a danger to her daughters. It's not clear if the clinician had all the information, but if they did, this statement was reckless and inaccurate. It did not represent good advice. Clearly, John was a danger due to his psychopathic and narcissistic characteristics. Even if the clinician didn't understand personality theory, John threatened to throw Jacqueline into the ocean. I'm not sure what type of warning sign the clinician was waiting for. I don't think John made that statement in the context of a fun day at the beach. Sometimes psychotherapists fall into the bad habit of saying what clients want to hear just for the sake of comforting the clients. This is a problem that is widespread in the field of mental health therapy. I think sometimes therapists don't want to drive clients away by delivering what they think is going to be interpreted as bad news. But always saying what clients want to hear is irresponsible. Item number five. One pronounced theme in the case of John Meehan is that he was like a zombie. Deborah's daughter, Tara, the woman who successfully defended herself against John, was a big fan of the TV series, The Walking Dead. This TV show is about several groups of people who attempt to survive a zombie apocalypse. The show features several actors who behave like mindless, reanimated corpses. A few of these actors are cast as zombies. From the TV show, Tara learned a few things about survival. For example, in the world of zombies, it's a good idea to attack the head of the zombie until it's destroyed. And Tara learned that the phrase, kill or be killed, is sometimes applicable to self-defense situations. In addition to the Walking Dead connection, there were several parallels between John and zombies. For example, reportedly, dogs would bark at John and generally feel uncomfortable around him, just like they would behave around zombies. John had lost a lot of weight by the time he attacked Tara. He had weighed 220 pounds, but on the day of the attack, he was 163. This was probably due to drug use. Zombies also struggle to keep weight on, probably because they're always walking, and their food preferences are restricted to mostly brains. John ceased functioning as a result of being stabbed in the brain. This is a common cause of zombie termination. John never changed his clothing. Zombies are not known for frequent wardrobe updates, although even a zombie would know not to wear scrubs to a formal dress event. John was described as frightening, evil, mindless, simplistic, and laser-focused on a single goal of seeking pleasure. Zombies are similar, except their only goal is to get brains. Now moving to my final thoughts. 
Con artists who focus on romance expose the essence of what attracts one person to another. Sometimes a romantic partner will forgive just about any negative in order to have access to the positive. John Meehan was essentially equivalent to a zombie, and yet still somehow managed to be attractive. When having traits of the undead isn't enough to be a deal-breaker, it's time for people to analyze their partner selection criteria more carefully. Those are my thoughts on the case of John Meehan. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.